Hello and welcome to the St. Geordi Festival in New York City. I'm Maya Jaggi, a critic and cultural journalist and artistic director in London. And I'm delighted to be speaking to the writer Amin Malouf about his novel, The Disoriented, published by World Editions, which is set in Lebanon a decade after the end of the Civil War. Originally published in French, the novel is out in May 2020 in an English translation by Frank Wynne, who I'm delighted is also joining us from his respective lockdown. Novelist, essayist, journalist and librettist, Amin Malouf was born in 1949 in Lebanon. Soon after the civil war broke out in 1975, he left Beirut and has lived in Paris ever since. When I met him there for a Guardian profile back in 2002, he told me that his modest ambition after winning the Prix Goncourt, France's premier literary award, was to build an oeuvre that might be read in a few years time. Now, novels such as Leo the African, Samarkand, The Rock of Tanyos, Ports of Call and Balthazar's Odyssey are not only read in French, but translated into more than 40 languages. Ranging across the Mediterranean and the old world of the Levant, they illuminate a common history that binds the Arab and Islamic worlds to Europe. His non-fiction classics, such as The Crusades Through Arab Eyes and In the Name of Identity, Violence and the Need to Belong, found a new readership in the wake of 9-11. Amin has also written a memoir, Origins, and four libretti for the Finnish composer Kaya Sariaho. He won Spain's Prince of Asturias Award for his oeuvre in 2010 and was elected to the Académie Française. This past February, very shortly before social distancing began, President Macron embraced him at the Elysee Palace in Paris to award him France's National Order of Merit for building bridges between East and West. Frank Wynne was born in Ireland, lives in London and has been translating from French and Spanish since the 1990s. His translation of Jean-Baptiste Delamo's novel Animalia has just won the Republic of Consciousness Prize, the latest of many awards for his work. These include the International Dublin Literary Award for Michel Welbeck's Atomized, the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize, the path-breaking award for fiction translated into English for Frédéric Begbeder's Wind Windows on the World, the Scott Moncrief Prize and the Premio Valier in Clan. He's also translated Amadou Karuma, Boalem Sansal, Claude Lanzmann, Thomas Eloy Martinez, Almudena Grandes, and Thomas Gonzalez, among many others. And in 2018, edited the anthology Found in Translation. Before we talk about the novel, I'd like very briefly to ask you both where you are now and what, what your experience has been of lockdown. Could I start with you, Amin? I'm in Paris. Mm -hmm. I've been in my apartment. In fact, I didn't leave it even once for the last uh, four weeks. Uh, I don't suffer much from it. I suffer from being worried for my mother and other people who might be at risk. But I, I enjoy part of the confinement because I work every day uh, as I used to work and even better than before. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't know uh, how long it will take uh, still, probably another month. We don't, no one knows at this point. Um, Frank, how about you? Where are you? Well, I started um, the beginnings of lockdown in Vietnam, where I was spending the winter and then raced home before, well, raced back to London before everything was shut down. So I literally made the last flight through Kuala Lumpur before Malaysia closed everything. Um, so I'm now in North London uh, and um, I'm isolating with um, a friend of mine. Um, like, I mean, because I'm, I've been working as a translator full time for 20 years. So I'm used to working on my own and being at home a lot of the time. My main problem is that now that everybody is working from home, they're annoying me. <laughs> <laughs> <I know laughs> they, they don't understand how to work at home. 
<laughs> but no, it's um, it's mostly worry about about others. I have a friend who has COVID at the moment, is in hospital uh, and seems to be improving. Uh, but then I also worry about my mother, who's in her 90s and, you know, my sister, who's a nurse. And, you know, it's mm. these are very strange times. Terrifying times. Um, well, onto the we'll come back to that, I think, but onto the novel, The Disoriented, um, which was published by World Editions and spans 16 days as Adam, a historian in Paris, returns to the bedside of a dying former friend in his homeland of Lebanon. But he arrives too late and instead he humours his widow by arranging a reunion of their circle of friends from university days who were scattered by the civil war. Yet as the friends meet up in a hotel in the mountains outside Beirut and on other locations, relating their lives over meze and champagne or arak, an affair blossoms, old grudges surface and bitterness erupts between those who stayed and those who left. While their fates seem to mirror the wider history of the region. I mean, you've always written in a variety of forms, but The Disoriented, first published in 2012, was your first novel in more than 10 years. And it also followed a memoir that you'd written in 2008, Origins. Now, you're mostly known for historical fiction, books about the fall of Granada, Omar Khayyam and so on. What made you return to fiction set in the recent past after Lebanon's civil war? And was that a subject you had avoided before? In fact, I had avoided it because I, I didn't feel I was ready yet to talk about my own life. Even now, I'm not completely ready. That's why I talk about it through uh, fiction. Mm. Uh, but uh, I would say that from the moment I began to write more than 40 years ago, I thought that one day I would talk about my university years. And that was uh, the moment in uh, I felt I had to to uh, uh, to talk about it indirectly, in fact, because this novel is is set up in uh, my university years in the city I uh, uh, I uh, spent my youth uh, and uh, I I felt that. Uh, the moment was uh, ready for me. Uh, uh, origin was something different, but maybe it paved the way for this work. Origin was based on uh, documents about my family, and it brought me back to Lebanon because <laughs> I, I um, most of my writings was away from Lebanon with, or uh, going around Lebanon without going there directly. And uh, maybe through origin, I came back more directly to, to my own uh, country and to my own life. Mm -hmm. And Frank, was, was this your first novel of Amin's that you translated? Um, and did you find it different in, in form and texture to um, Amin's historical novels because it's set very recently? Um, it's the first of his novels that I've translated. I actually read it when it was published in uh, 2012. And I then spent several years trying to persuade a variety of editors that someone somewhere desperately needed to publish this book. It is, there are similarities um, in terms of the way that Amin uses language to his earlier novels. But one of the things that I thought was very important about this book is it is the first time that he admittedly as a fictional character goes home uh, since he left in the 1970s and there is something enormously poignant in that and there is clearly also a reluctance in it in fact you've both talked about this book as being set in lebanon lebanon is never mentioned in this book beirut is never mentioned in this book no place no, well there are a few place names mentioned there is a small church there is an old monastery but mm -hmm. in fact 
he is going home, but still cannot bring himself somehow uh, to say that this is home. And of course, part of what I think is extraordinary about this book it is about where home is, uh, whether it is where you currently live or where you have adopted, uh, or where it is where you grew up. Um, and also the, the sense between all of the friends um, whom we can judge or not judge as we choose, that the decision that they made was the right one. Mm. Which applies um, to so many people who've been displaced for whatever reason um, all over the world. Now, the title, The Disoriented, might suggest displacement, emigration, um, also disoriented, being wrenched from the East. But there's also a nostalgia throughout the, the book, um, not only for a lost country or a country that's changed and been lost, but also for, for youth, for idealism. I mean, there's, a, there's that that's universal about it. And for a kind of lost Eden of porous borders, fluid religious affiliations. The friends are Muslim, Christian, Jewish. Um, there are ties to Egypt, ties um, to Iraq and other, other countries in the region, as well as people who are li living in North America and Europe. Um, I wonder, I mean, if you could tell us a little about your own um, background, your family, and how that influenced your own view of, of religion, your own complex view of, of identity and of the region where, where you grew up. Well, Lebanon, as uh, you know, is a country of many communities, which is both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing when those communities are uh, able to live together and uh, uh, share a lot of things, and it becomes a curse when they cannot live in peace together and uh, uh, I've I've seen both both moments. There was a moment; uh, it was not flawless, but it, there was a moment where communities were able to live together, and uh, it was a beautiful moment for for the country, for that part of the world, the Levant. And then I I was a witness to to the the moment where everything was shattered and. Uh, uh, and I cannot uh, but feel that what happened in that small country, which is my country of uh, origin, has also in a way happened for the whole world. Uh, I think uh, the, this idea of communities who are not able anymore to live together and who, who, who fight all the time and who use violence to assert their identity uh, this is the the history of the 30 or 40 years we have spent uh, uh, and uh, i i of course uh, as frank was saying i i feel nostalgia for a country which is no more uh, the one i knew but i also i feel nostalgia for the world which has gone in a direction which i uh, didn't uh, wish for. I, I hoped for something completely different. I hoped for a world that would open and uh, for uh, th this uh, uh, globalization to be really a, a feast, a, a, a huge, a huge moment of, of uh, sharing everything. And, and it's turning into a nightmare, you know, where, where we pe people, uh, can uh, no more really live together completely. The, the, the tensions are heightened. The, 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 the everybody asserts one's identity with, uh, with uh, aggressivity. And, uh, and now uh, with, with what's happening today, we feel that uh, uh, we, we are disoriented, not, <laughs> not only people who came from the Orient. I think mm. our our humankind is disoriented today, and I, 
I feel that all all what I dreamt of in my youth is has been shattered. Mm. And Frank, one of the things, one of these fluidities for which there's a, a kind of nostalgia or the, a, an ease in this milieu that's recreated is a multilingualism, that these characters move between Arabic, French and English with ease and they're always switching and deciding in any gathering which language they should be speaking. Mm -hmm. Now that probably you live like that and, and some people do, but is not something um, general. Um, can you tell us a bit about how you ap approach the novel in terms of the languages because you signal sometimes which language is, uh, people are speaking and is there a difference in, in I mean French uh, when he's, he's characterizing people speaking in Arabic or how, how does that work? Um, there are small markers here and there where actually even before he tells me I can tell what language the character is speaking because there is a there is a, there is a difference in register between um, um, how people will speak to each other in French than how they will speak to each other in Arabic and you try in translating to bring something of that without bringing so much that it just begins to feel stilted um, it's a very difficult thing to to indicate um, because um, people who move between languages generally, I mean, if, if you are among a group of people who speak different languages and you happen to speak some of them, not only does the way in which you speak or the register in which you speak change, but, and this sounds a bit bizarre, you are a slightly different person in every language. Um, I, I gesture much more when I use French. I use, uh, I am much more sing-songy when I speak Spanish. Uh, I am, um, all of these things are, are not things that I've chosen to do. They're just when I was living in this place at this time, this is who I was and this is who I am in that language. And it's, it's a very difficult thing um, to, to capture that fluidity. I mean, it's interesting. Um, in the 1960s and particularly the 1970s in um in the lebanon was entirely sort of uh, there was a fluidity um in terms of i mean i mean went to university as these characters did with people uh, who spoke different languages who came from different backgrounds there was no sense that they should or shouldn't marry this or that person i mean we are told um that you know uh, that their mothers are worried as to whether the boy has a good job, but not whether he is Muslim, whether he is Maronite, whether he is whatever. And also they are bound, you said yourself, this is about an idealistic time, they are bound by the books that, as it were, the literate West was reading at the time. So by Gramsci, by a, uh, a relatively sort of benign version of, um, socialism and openness and whatever and with the closing of of the levant all of that has gone um i mean you have ended up not only with people whose religious uh who do not associate with each other for religious reasons but also who have withdrawn into a much more um dogmatic and conservative mindset politically mm. I mean, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think I, I totally agree. For, first, uh, about uh, languages, I think uh, when you want to express something, you don't just express your idea in a different language. The way you, you, you express it changes the idea itself. And so the, it's not exactly the same idea. <laughs> when when you choose the language, the language in which you you express it. So uh, there's a process of translation going on even at the level of of ideas. And... Well, I think it's more that um, actually language shapes how you can formulate an idea. Um, certain languages have either specific expressions or specific words, but also just the way in which language functions. So I mean, it is a standard thing that we consider that uh well foreigners consider the dutch the dutch to be rude the rutch the dutch consider themselves to be plain spoken 
Um, the Dutch would never, if you say, how are you today? The Dutch would never say, oh, I'm fine, thanks, how are you, if they're not. If you say, uh, you know, would, so it, culture and language form together and how you speak is determined by the language, by the culture. Uh, and so, you know, um, I think that how you then express your ideas changes. And I, I would add, it's also determined by the audience you have in mind when you speak that language. Mm -hmm. Because the audience doesn't have exactly the same cultural references, the words are different. So uh, many reasons you can, you don't just speak with another language, you say something else whenever you use another language. Mm. Okay, this, this is a subject that we could go on um, <laughs> for, for a long time, but I'm going to, I'm going to move it a little. Um, back to something that's central to the novel, which is the idea of a grudge, that Adam sees his former friend, um, whose bedside he rushes to, as having, in a sense, betrayed shared values of their youth during the war, um, when Adam left and this, this friend stayed and perhaps became embroiled, corrupted to a certain extent by, by the war itself. Adam says, impunity is as pernicious as injustice. In fact, they're two sides of the same coin. Could you explain that a little and also how this, this tale of friends and a grudge relates to post-war Lebanon, um, to the idea of, of amnesty uh, after the war, of impunity? Could you talk a little about that? Uh, when there is a war, a very vicious uh, civil war, uh, either you choose to leave the country or you stay. And if you stay, you cannot uh, maintain the same values, the same standards. You have to, to accept uh, compromises. And uh, I, I feel it a lot because I left very early. So I didn't have to, to, to accept a number of things. And I have spoken to people who stayed there. And uh, there is, there is a, a dilemma. Either you decide to, to go and keep your hands clean to, uh, or you remain there and if you want to continue to work and to have a role in society, you have to, to dirty your hands. And uh, th this is a, uh, this is a, a dilemma uh, one has to, to, to accept and uh, uh, it's, uh, I, I know that it's easy when, when you have left the, at the beginning of the war to 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 say that you you were not you were not involved in any kind of uh, violence or uh, and uh, the idea that impunity is uh, also partly injustice i i feel it very strongly because uh, pardon, forgiveness is something that is, I, I value a lot, but uh, it has rules. To, 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 to be forgiven, one has to accept responsibility, to show, to show some remorse, to, to look forward to, to a, a, a different attitude, but you cannot just come and say, well, whatever was done during this war, all massacres are for, for, forgotten, are forgiven. And uh, I, I think this is not, not just, this is, uh, mm -hmm. it's a kind of injustice. Oh, I just um, wondered if you would like to say anything about the recent um, protests in, in Lebanon. Um, before the default on the debt, before the coronavirus, there, there was a, a kind of revolution in, in October. Um, 
one of the reasons people were out on the street was to say this is should be the end of the civil war and that the um, people in power who remain in some cases warlords from that era should go. So it was a movement against, in some ways, impunity. Could, could you say a little about your view of that period um, and also how it relates to the Civil War period? Uh, I think the, the Civil War is, of course, uh, a problem, but it's also the uh, a an expression of a deeper problem, which is communi uh, communitarism, confessionalism, the, as they say in Lebanon. Uh, the, the system, the political system, as it functions, it, it was like that already before the Civil War, and it, it's much more like that today, is a, a, a system where uh, representatives of uh, the communities uh, uh, are confiscate power in fact and use it to uh, uh, to further their ambitions uh, the to uh, to loot the, the, the country and uh, it reached a point in around October, where the country was broke, uh, while everybody knows that the political leaders had amassed fortunes abroad. And uh, there was a, an uprising. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the political uh, leaders uh, convinced some people that the cause of the crisis was uprising <laughs> while it was just a reaction to 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 uh, um, to, to the fact that the country has gone bankrupt and then came the the confinement <laughs> which made any street pro uh, protest unthinkable so so today, uh, I, I don't know to seem too pessimistic, but you have a country which has defaulted on payments, a, a population which is convinced that it, uh, uh, it's uh, re uh, led by people uh, it cannot trust, but yet uh, uh, no, no uh, protest is possible and no other political system is in sight. So it's, it's a very, very uh, uh, sad moment in the history of the country. And uh, I cannot uh, help remembering what it was before, before the war, uh, what were the ambitions, what were the hopes, the quality of uh, of hospitals, of universities, it, it was it was a thriving uh, country, and now it's diminished in uh, every respect. Maya, can I just come in on, on two things? One um, about um, the novel and how it deals with uh, impunity. That possibly the best counter attack to Adam's statement is made by Murad's widow, Tanya. Um, and she is the one who feels most bitter. She feels that Adam has lived, you know, in a perfectly nice flat somewhere. He doesn't come home for holidays. He goes to the south of France and he is judging from afar difficult decisions that had to be made. Now, it seems in the novel that Murad's decisions may well have been suspect, but her attitude is it's all very well when your hands are clean uh, to look down on everyone else. It is we who stayed who are fighting to create a country. Um, those of you who left don't get to judge that. And she, I suppose what I really like about the novel is that the individual friends have very different viewpoints 
both on the time they shared together and on the time they've been apart. And it allows for a, a proper exploration of um, how easy it is to simply assign responsibility and, and effectively say, it wasn't my fault, it was someone else's. But the other thing with, with impunity, I was translating um, a novel by uh, Javier Cercas, and he f frequently returns to the period uh, the just after the death of Franco and the effective mass pardoning of everyone. And when he talks about it, he says um, that he feels that while impunity is wrong, if people had been held to account at that time, there would have been no transition from Franco Spain to a democracy. It's, it would simply have gone down into an ongoing series of grudges of who was to blame. And therefore, what has happened, and in fact, his novels are part and parcel of it, is there was a national forgetting, which lasted about 20 years. And it is only the children of that generation who are now beginning to talk about um, the terrible things that happened um, during um, the Franco regime in, in, in Spain. I mean, do you think, I mean, that there will have to be, that if for peace to be possible, that um, there will have to be that kind of national forgetting. No, uh, very interesting what you're saying. Uh, what happened in Spain is that they went from the Franco uh, dictatorship to mm -hmm. an open country, democratic, uh, part of the uh, European Union. So uh, they, they woke up in a completely different world. And it was a, a healthy reaction to say, OK, we're not stopping to look behind us and punish those who had done this or that. We are taking advantage of the new reality. And it's, it's marvelous. Uh, it, it did not happen in many countries. In Lebanon, you, you, you're not in a post. No a post-communitarism uh, Lebanon, not really in a post-war Lebanon. The, the, the people who were in charge are still in charge. The country is ruined. It's part of nothing. It's not part of, uh, of an, a, a European Union. When it's broke, it's not like Greece. Nobody was, was, will come and, and save. No mom will come and save the child from uh, from what's happening to 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 him, so uh, uh, Lebanon can cannot just forget and move on because he, uh, he doesn't know where to move. We're not we're going nowhere today. We're in a, in, in an area of the world which is uh, one of the most violent. There is no no kind no no peace no. No, no, no cooperation between the countries. It's going. Uh, 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 it's it's not moving. It's not developing. It's it's probably the area of the world which is not at all moving. Like Asia is moving. Europe uh, has different problem, but it's uh, it's a developed part of the world. The the Middle East is stuck. It's going nowhere. So uh, you, uh, it's not Fair enough for Lebanon to <laughs> to 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 just to forget. I, uh, um, in fact, writers, um, including yourself, looking historically at the, the region, have been part of a movement to remember in some ways and been repositories of, of memory. And one of the things that I, I love about this novel is that it's full of moral dilemmas, as, as Frank was saying, people, different ways of looking at the same conundrums and philosophical uh, debates, which are almost parables. It's full of fables. Um, we're going to hear a, a short reading. Um, uh, if. If Amin, if you would mind reading a few lines in French, and then Frank is going to uh, round up with the yeah, with English section. Thank you. Jeudi, en s'endormant, Adam ne pensait pas 
que le lendemain même, il s'envolerait vers le pays de ses origines après des lustres d'éloignement volontaire et pour se rendre auprès d'un homme à qui il s'était promis de ne plus adresser la parole. Mais l'épouse de Mourad avait su trouver les mots imparables « Ton ami va mourir, il demande à te voir ». On Thursday, as he fell asleep, Adam was not thinking that the very next day he would fly back to the country of his birth after young, long years of voluntary exile to see a man he had vowed never to speak to again. But Murad's wife had managed to find the words that were unanswerable. Your friend is dying. He is asking to see you. The telephone had rung at 5 a.m. Adam had blindly fumbled for the receiver, pressed one of the blacklit buttons and answered, no, no, honestly, I wasn't asleep or some comparable lie. The woman on the other end of the line had said, I'll put him on. He'd had to hold his breath to listen to the dying man, and even then he had intuited rather than heard the words. The distant voice was like a rustle of fabric. Two or three times Adam had to say, sure, and I understand, though he did not understand and was not sure of anything. When the other man had fallen silent, he had ventured a cautious goodbye. He had kept his ear pressed to the receiver for a few seconds in case the man's wife came back on the line. Only then had he hung up. He had turned to his partner, Dolores, who had turned on the light and sat up in bed, leaning against the wall. She gave the impression that she was weighing the pros and cons, but her mind was already made up. Your friend is going to die. He called you. You can't wait around. You have to go. My friend? What friend? We haven't spoken to each other in 20 years. In fact, for many years, whatever Murad's name came up and Adam was asked whether he knew him, he invariably responded, he's a former friend. Often the people he was speaking to assumed he meant an old friend, but Adam did not choose words lightly. He and Murad had been friends. They had ceased to be friends. From his point of view, former friend was, therefore, the only fitting formulation. Usually when he used the expression in front of her, Dolores would simply smile sympathetically, but that morning she had not smiled. If I fell out with my sister tomorrow, would she suddenly be my former sister or my brother my former brother? Family is different. You don't get to choose. You don't get to choose in this case either. A childhood friend is an adoptive brother. You may regret adopting him, but you cannot unadopt him. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. It's a wonderful book, The Disoriented. Thank you so much to Amin Malouf and his translator, Frank Wynne. Thank you. <laughs>